Okay, we'll get started on what happened Friday. And uh, I, I have legal counsel over to my right, so if I say something wrong, she feels liberty to correct me. Please do so. Uh, I want to make sure. Contract <laughs> so I just want to make sure that uh, I get my stuff right as we start on this. First of all, you know, what happened Friday, a lot of stuff has gone out on the Facebook page and on the media that is just really not probably close to the truth, which of course, we're seeing them now, a lot of people in the media are just not being honest. Uh, they're out there to tell you, they tell, they're out there to tell you how to think, rather than to tell you, here's the information, now I'm going to think. So, <laughs> <laughs> the lawyer just left the room. <laughs> Um, what I'm going to try to do is just do that, share the information with you. First of all, on Friday, on the constitutional aspect of abortion, the Supreme Court actually had finally somebody argued the case correctly. Uh, years in all my life, all the, all the lawyers were always going to the Supreme Court justices talking about when does life begin. And that's really not a question for the judges to decide. This case that was brought up from Mississippi actually challenged whether or not abortions in the Constitution. That's what it really did. And the Supreme Court justices, even Ruth Ginsburg, also said the same thing. Abortion is a constitutional weak right. It's not really solidified. So there is nothing in the Constitution about abortion. Therefore, the judges have to say they stand down and said look if it deals with the constitution we're in that's why the difference between the guns and the abortion are not are different right is there a constitutional right about the guns 
Yeah, so the, the, the judges have to have to deal with that. But there's nothing about the abortion in, in the Constitution. And so what ended up with the judge, justices doing the same thing they did was something back in the 70s. You know what, what I'm referring to back in the 70s, in which there was a lot of heat on the Supreme Court justices, and for a moment they, they, they said, fine. They outlawed something in the country, five, at least a minimum of five judges outlawed something in the country that no more states could practice. You know what it was? Capital punishment. Remember? Capital punishment was outlawed throughout the country for some years in the 70s. But, but let's, let's look at that. They set a precedent that capital punishment is not, is not going to be used. But then a number of states brought a lawsuit to the Supreme Court, and the lawsuit basically did well with capital punishment. Set it to states, right? Set it back to the states. Send it back to the states. And that's where it's at. And that's just what they did with this issue. They sent it back to the states. When you really think about it, do five people, no matter how intelligent they are, have a right to determine the ethics of 330 million people? That's a lot of power. So, um, you know, you, you had six of them, which I was surprised there were six of them that basically said, this doesn't belong here anymore. Um, it belongs back with the states like capital punishment. Uh, and when you, uh, when you look at the Civil War, I talked about this in the men's final class yesterday. The first uh, constitution that they were messing with to bring the colonies together was called what? Articles of Confederation, which meant we don't want a lot of federal power influence in our state lives. But the Articles of Confederation died, right? Because there was enough people saying, no, we need to be more federated. We need to be more federal this way. So they made the Constitution. And then you go to the Civil War. And what did they call the South? Confederate States of America. Which means, again, the South was going to be giving power to the states more to than a consolidated government. The North was like, no, Abraham Lincoln was arguing, forget about the slavery issue right now, but just talk about Confederacy versus Union, that the Union at all costs must be preserved. I don't know if this has ever been settled in our history, of how the Tenth Amendment and the federal powers job. This is an issue that will probably never be resolved in our country about state rights and where the federal government needs to stand down and let the state rights deal with these issues. So, we received this information from Dami Young, which is on your table. Um, Dami Young is the director of First Look. And I take her as a very uh, strong and trustful resource about what takes place. So I don't know if you've heard on the news, and this is true, all these, many states have trigger laws. You know what they mean by trigger laws? And this will go into play. Some of the states have trigger laws immediately if Roe v. Wade got overturned. She shared with us today that the trigger law in Texas is 30 days. So this trigger law that the state of Texas has put together is not going to be in effect until July 25th. Now, there's a lot of misinformation out there. I've seen this on Facebook and, and the news, like, oh, now this is going to be going against in vitro fertilization. It's going to go against birth control. It's going to get emergency contraception. It's going to, you know, uh, not be able to treat ectopic pregnancy. I mean, it's just on and on and on of all the lies out there. It's not true. All we're dealing with right now, and the Supreme Court just basically said is, you guys go figure it out. That's all that happened. That's all that happened. Just, you guys go figure it out. Back to the states. So what did Texas put into place? Um, it's called Chapter 178, Texas Health and Safety Code. Uh, Donna, in her email, says, will ban abortion in Texas? Not fully true. 
I was surprised to read Texas 170A online. So that's what's on the next sheet. So if you just kind of look at the first page of definitions, this is the law that's going to go into effect in Texas in a month. The bicarbonatal diameter in section three there, I don't know if I'm even pronouncing that right, B-I-P-A-R-I-E-T-L, diameter. Um, so if that diameter is less than 60 millimeters, that baby is liable for abortion in Texas. What is the actual diameter for 37 weeks in term? 91.5. So when a doctor sees that this baby is less than 60, the chances of survival for that child are going to be really, really weak. So it's not going to be, get that. It's not going to be protecting babies that do not qualify. This law will not protect babies that do not qualify. Um, then you look at prohibited acts, but exceptions to the rule. Uh, section B, a person may not intentionally or knowingly perform an abortion on a woman who is pregnant with a viable unborn child during the third trimester of the pregnancy with a less exception. So it means, therefore, in Texas, Texas will allow abortion up to how many months? Six. Six. So this is not how long abortion in Texas. You can still get an abortion in Texas up to six months. After the six months, this is what must happen. Um, it does not prohibit a person from performing an abortion if at the time of the abortion the person is a physician and concludes in good faith, according to the physician's best medical judgment, that the fetus is not a viable fetus and the pregnancy is not in the third trimester. Two, here it is, the abortion is necessary to prevent the death or a substantial risk of serious impairment to the physical or mental health of the woman. A lot of people are out there arguing, oh, well, this, you're going to make the woman die because of the baby. It's like, you guys got it wrong. You're just living on fear factors. I mean, right there, even in the state of law, is if the life of the mother is in danger, yes, it's permissible. Even up to the ninth month. That's a problem for us. Yeah. I mean, in the Roman Catholic Church, Abortion is not law all the way, just blanket, not even for the life of the mother. In our Lutheran church, we say abortion is liable to preserve the life of the mother. But when you get to the mental health issue, anybody can say that the mother, that the baby is a stress. So is Texas really going to be any different than what's going on in our country now? I'm not sure, Ken. The heartbeat bill, but again, they're making these exceptions. You can actually, you can actually argue the white mother can actually argue according to this law that this is a mental stress to me. I cannot live with this. This law allows that baby to be aborted because of mental health. And there, and there will be people out there in the Catholic Street marketing themselves that I will save your baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is this is not a battle that's been resolved at all. What, where does instead of instead of having the battle at the Supreme Court about this whole issue, where is the battle now going to be? The state, state Supreme Court, and the laws of the land. And I, I really kind of think myself personally, I think it's going to, I think it needs to be the conversation needs to be held there, than in the Washington D.C. area. Of course, some people may disagree with me and they have the right to do so, but I think this conversation, the more close you have to the grassroots. I think the more effective it will be. But yes, uh, mental health, which is that. I was surprised it's in there. I really was. I just thought, okay, fine. Uh, preserve the life of the mother. And I said, yeah, we were all for that. Let's round it. But mental health, wow, a lot of people can argue that. True. Yeah. Um, three, the fetus, the fetus has a severe and irreversible abnormality identified by reliable diagnostic procedures. Again, eugenic abortion is still going to be allowed in Texas. You know what I mean by eugenic abortions, right? The baby's not 100% healthy, and uh, uh, we, we just think it's best for the baby that the baby dies rather than, you know, 
is born, eugenic abortion. So eugenic abortion will be allowed until the ninth month. Um, last page. Um, a physician who performs an abortion that, according to the physician's best medical judgment, the time of the abortion is to abort a viable unborn child during the third trimester of the pregnancy shall certify in writing to the commission on a form prescribed by the commission. So basically what this is, is that phrase, abortion on demand. Got that? Because you could just go in the way the Supreme Court had to right now, you could just demand an abortion and the doctor has to not write anything, certify why this child needs to be aborted. Because you just demand abortion, it's got to happen. But the doctor now has to justify an abortion from the sixth to the ninth month. And it has to go to the Safety Health Commission. That's the law of Texas. But it doesn't have to be filed until the 30th day of the court. So yes. It's not like a check to see whether you've got some provider that's going to come in. Right. Yeah. Yep. 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 So there's a lot of loopholes. So the state of Texas is not banning in vitro fertilization. I don't know. You know why they, they're raising the in vitro fertilization stuff? Can you give me the argument on this one? Have you heard of it? Um, I think technology's gotten a little bit better, but in vitro fertilization, uh, you have a woman that's got her eggs, they, they extract her eggs, and then they take the semen from the man, it could be your own husband, and they, they combine them together in a test tube and then bang, you get five fertilized embryos. What do they do with those fertilized embryos? They immediately freeze them, okay? Then maybe right comes an opportunity to put those eggs inside a uterus somewhere. Um, when they do, what do fertilization doctors like to do? Do they only put one embryo in the uterus or do they like to put multiple? Well, why do they want to put multiple embryos in the uterus? Yeah, because most likely one is not going to survive. You put three or four chances of actually having a baby make it is better. Okay, so pro-lifers, and I'm not necessarily saying we're involved in this pro-life argument, but there is the argument that says when you intentionally throw four embryos in there with the idea that only one of that's going to survive, so are you creating an abortion? I don't, I don't know if you can go with that point because the fact is, let's, let's look at the truth of the matter is, um, I've known a lady in my life that took fertilization drugs. And what happens in fertilization drugs is many times you just don't get pregnant with one, you get pregnant with multiple. She had triplets. Um, and then you have that, and then you let God take it over from there, right? You got three babies growing in there, maybe one of them doesn't survive. But if the one doesn't survive, it's not because man has actually taken away. It's just that nature's not supported that child in the womb and let nature take its course. So I don't really see any difference between fertilization drugs and embryonic implantation um, in that argument because you're just, again, allowing nature to take its course. You go, if God wants all four of those embryos to survive, survive. You know, let, let God be the judge. Let God. But for some reason, people are saying, well, that's going to be out the window because you're not going, because they're going to say you're killing babies. And I'm saying, again, I think they're just creating a fear factor with the embryo in vitro fertilization argument. Our church body is not against it. But the Roman Catholics are. Roman Catholics are against individual fertilization because, again, they just will argue in their doctrinal agreement that uh, anything to conceive children outside of the God-designed marital union is wrong. So, they don't speak strongly in their doctrine, but that's what it is in the Roman churches. They never condone individual fertilization. They just thought that that was an aberration. Pregnancy, uh, which was not God's design. Uh, our church body has kind of left that for a moment of question. Um, birth control. 
I did not know this, so this came out Friday. This was news to me, shocking news to me. Fact. 60% of our abortions in this country are done by the pill. Did you hear that? That came out on this? 60% of abortions are done by the pill. Are you 486? Been a good controversy in Christianity for a long time. Called the morning after pill. Um, it basically seeks to destroy the baby that's been, the embryo has been fertilized. Are you 486? Since a man or woman is taking the pill, who becomes the issue of death? Yeah, that's where it gets wrong. If God wants that child to live, it will live. If God does not want that child to live, it will not. I mean, we have these things in the world called miscarriages. It happens. It's a grievous thing for a woman to experience miscarriage. It's so desire to be mine. Um, but let God be the judge of life. So the RU 46 is outlawed in our church body. Not the birth control pill, but the RU 46 is. And we maintain that. And so whether or not how the state of Texas and other states are going to deal with that, that's going to be something down the road. Um, right now, the state of Texas is not talking about the RU 46. It's still going to be legal in Texas. And 60% of abortions are done by the RU 46, which I thought was outstanding. Oh, wow. And if you're going to be affected with the RU 46, I think that bill's got to be taken with it first month or shortly right around that pregnancy. So um, it's done very, very early in pregnancy. Emergency contraception, I don't know if that's not much different from in vitro fertilization. Again, the state of Texas is not going to be speaking anything to that or about treating a miscarriage and treating an ectopic pregnancy. Why would the Lutheran Church in Missouri Senate be okay with, with an abortion with an ectopic pregnancy? Endangering the mother's life. Yes. Yes. So, you know, and, and yet there's many of the people out there just screaming, this is all going to be, it's like, if you all just need to take a breath, people, and read the laws and, and just let's have a conversation about this without screaming and yelling at each other. Um, so, this law is not going to prosecute women who have an abortion. And again, that's a, you're hearing that, right? They're going to send these women to jail. No. Is there? Yeah. Are some states talking about it? Yes. Oklahoma is? Oklahoma, I think Oklahoma has a very good law. Really? Hmm. I know that it just came out, Justin Kavanaugh said that you cannot prosecute a woman who she is seek to cross state lines for abortion. So now the Supreme Court has the right to talk about that. Cross yes, they do. Crossing state lines. Yes. Interstate, interstate, interstate commerce. commerce. They have a right to be involved in that discussion. That's in the Constitution. So they can control that. I mean, the justices that do. They're very reasonable. I mean, they just came out, these six, they just, this argument doesn't belong here. But if you're going to prohibit transportation across, now that argument, because it's in the Constitution, we regulate interstate commerce. So, yes, um, people of states that are going to prosecute, if they seek to go across the line, uh, that will be at the Supreme Court. And, and they're going to lose because of the way the Constitution is. Yeah, and, 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 and when they say those things, the thing that I always want to say is I want to really see the paper, just like this. I want to see what exactly is in the law. Well, they probably will, you know, because you, you may not be able to be full extreme on it, but maybe through time of education um, and conversation, we'll see where this goes down the road. Um, you know, the one argument they, they love to also argue about, you know, mental health is greater than sex. Um, so I looked at the information again, statistics on this. Planned Parenthood. Got to trust them when they come from Planned Parenthood. 
Um, Planned Parenthood says the likelihood of conception from rape or incest is 3%. Only 3%. So that's why the pro-lifers say that yeah, if you want to put a clause on there that abortion is not lot except for rape or incest, we're going to be happy with that because it rarely happens. It rarely happens. And uh, out of all the abortions done in our country, only 1% are due to rape or incest. It rarely happens. So if, if people are going to Argue the case about rape and incest, we're more than likely to say, fine, you know, we'll, we'll allow the exception to that because it's very minimal. It's just not a very big aspect of the abortion. So, if abortion is not being done for rape and incest, what's it being done for? Convenience, birth control. Is this an actual viable birth control? Uh, so, that, I hope you take this home. If you have people talk about things, and uh, you know, I encourage you not to talk about it on Facebook. <laughs> I gotta give credit to Mike Gleason, the white, one of the wisest guys. He said to try and argue with people on Facebook is trying to baptize a cat. <laughs> yeah. Just, just don't do it. Yeah, a cat might even be easier. So, uh, make statements. I, I did make a statement on my Facebook page quoting C.S. Lewis about, you know, people, let's just love each other, even if it's, if it's very challenging to love. C.S. Lewis kind of made a comment that, uh, you know, Christians are asked to love even if they don't like people. You love them. And over the course of time, you end up finding yourself liking people you didn't think you ever would. And he said, on the flip side, it's just as bad that if you Look at the Germans and the, uh, and, and the Jews. The Germans hated the Jews, and then they treated them cruelly. And the more cruelly they treated them, the more they hated them. The more cruel you are, the more hatred you have. The more hatred you have, the more cruel you become. And I see that in these wars of our ethics in our country. We're becoming very cruel uh, to each other. And uh, instead of hating the other side, you know, love your enemies. I think. Jesus said that, right? Love your enemies and pray for your enemies. Yeah. Yeah. And Jesus didn't say that. <laughs> Keep your friends close and your enemies close. No, that, that's not a quote from Jesus Christ. But it's probably a wise one to follow. Um, so, any questions that you have? I don't know. I'm not like, this is what I know right now. And this is what I share with you. That do what we can at Christ the King to get the truth out and to try and tone the conversation down right now. It is not as bad as some of the media is making it out to be. Yeah, I'll. And that's where plan, not plan, that's where Donna Young, if you again uh, look at what she says, first look is going to be needed more now than ever because of that situation. They need the support and the mentality. Yeah. And you know, you said something a while back about not being, I don't know how you said it, but not being in one area and not being frustrated with them. Yeah. People who need a nurture. Yes, they're never going to come to faith if we judge and make them feel like they're villains. But a lot of these situations that they're bringing up, I mean, of course, I roll my eyes because it's her degree, but they're like married couples who have kids, and they don't feel like they can support the kids they have if they have more, and they weren't planning to have more, 
much truth to say, well, why didn't you use a contraceptive? Why didn't you do this? Look at us. You know, we've been doing that. <laughs> Somebody said, what about just giving $4,000 to a woman that wants to, an employee that wants to have a child? Yeah. <laughs> why, why, what's the difference? Why are you discriminating? John? I was going to say, uh, like Holly was saying, we need to nurture people. And here when we leave the church, we have a sign that says, uh, you're now going into the mission field. Yeah. Why don't we have a sign that says, uh, do you feel uh, bad? Do you feel like you're a sinner? You feel like the, this building right here is full of people who know better than you? Well, you're right. Come on. <laughs> I will see how well that works. I don't know if that's going to be working very, you know, uh, very attractive to the human nature. But I mean, all you say is true. <laughs> you know, all you say is true. That's correct. Um, anything other? Uh, I just want to say, and I'm in tears, so I didn't know yeah. You need to support first love and people yes. like them. Yeah. You need to educate, starting with the younger women and teaching them about not only porn and all that kind of stuff, but sexual morality, sexual in your life. Talk about contraception. And I'll, my poor daughter's right here, so I'll just, she's going to be something years old, but I'll throw her under the bus. I said, well, for college, I said, uh, do you, are you going to need birth control? Yeah, let's go to talk to my doctor before you leave. Oh, no, 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 Okay, you know. What a kind of thing. Uh, but we need to educate. We need to support young women who need oral contraceptives or whatever. You know, let's stop it before yeah. they get pregnant. Yeah. I was surprised. Because we're not going to save the whole world right. and, and have everybody's yeah. sexual parents. We can't control any of that. Right. But, I mean, I've done abortions in the hospital yeah. years ago, and I feel so sad. I've seen little arms and little legs right, right now, okay? Yeah. And talk about trauma for right. me, uh, not to mention the young woman. Right. Was, uh, I was right. with the patient, right. not with the baby. So right. I was there while I was the patient advocate. So, uh, but I mean, it, it, I've lived and seen it. Uh, uh, let's don't fight with little arms and yelling. Exactly. Let's spend this energy and this money on education, health clinics. Right. Right. Yeah. We've got finally we got first look in our budget, and we just gave them a million a minimum. Of, we just throw them a token thousand dollars. I, I know we should do better, but maybe I, since this is our first mission here with first look, hopefully we'll continue to grow and support that because it's actually just what happened here. But the other thing that was fascinating is the education that Diane is bringing up. I have been I'm not not lately, but when I some years ago. I was resistant strongly to talk about sex education and confirmation class. And I had to sit down and talk with parents about it some years ago. I don't have that battle now. I think because people are seeing the issue. Um, it's like, okay, is your daughters uh, watching TV and movies? Well, yeah. And are they watching movies that are rated and sex is all over the place? Well, yeah. Are you realizing that that's their teacher now? That's their teacher. What? I said, yeah. Do you not think the church should be involved in this conversation? Or should we just, because we want to be prudish about it and not talk about it? Um, I think I think the 
research needs to be there early. And there has early, there has curriculum out there. I mean, didn't you use a, a you two use material? When did it, what age group did that start with? On Christian sex education. I did it for fifth grade with Catherine and Alex, and I'll do the same with Morgan. Um, but Morgan knows the birds and the bees. Yeah. And she's entering fourth grade. Right. And they know the birds and the bees, they need to know how to handle it. And so why do you want to avoid the conversation? We need to be there. And, and their main source really needs to be there. It's not the church, the parents. But I don't know about your upbringing, but I tell you, in my family, it, it just something was a conversation I never had. My dad, pastor though he be, basically uh, let me learn from the streets. And I was shocked when I heard how babies were made. <laughs> and I was in. Have you figured it out? <laughs> <laughs> <At> least twice. At least twice. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, Genesis 28, verse 31. 
Yeah, yeah. 29, I'm sorry, 29, 31. 29, 31, just read verse 31. 29, verse 31. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, opened her womb, because Rachel was there. Think about that text for a second. What does the Bible say about the control of the womb? belongs to God. Yeah. And, uh, you know, then Rachel, chapter 30, she gets upset because uh, she's not having babies. Chapter 30, verses 1 and 2, read that. When Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. She said to Jacob, Give me children, or I shall, or I shall die. Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel, and he said, Am I in the place of God, who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? So what does Jacob believe about the power of conception? God's hands. It's God's hands. All right, so there you go with the Bible reference there, you know, poking the bear, Janet. Um, I think, though, over the course of time, you know, I think our CTCR documents and theologians have been okay with this fact is you look at the individual fertilization and uh, these methods. Question is, is this a way of God opening the womb for people whose wombs cannot be opened naturally? Maybe. Yeah. So you know what I do with that question? I walk away. <laughs> I, I, I'll, if you use it for fertilization, I really want to make sure, though, that the people that use it still understand that the power of life is not from the scientist or the doctor, it still comes from God. You cannot lose that perspective. Because once you lose that perspective, if life comes from your hand, who's control of it? You are. And therefore, you can do whatever you want to do with life. You know, my body, my choice. People don't understand what they're saying when they say that. Because if you're going to argue that case, my body, my choice, then that is nihilism, which means just do whatever you want with your body. It's your choice. You can commit suicide. Throw all the drugs the body you want. Do we have laws against people using your illegal drugs? Uh, Okay, that, that, that my body, my choice doesn't work there. And the other aspect is, no, we, we limit your use of your body. Does a person have a right to use their body to take a gun and kill somebody? My body, my choice. If I want to use my gun to shoot somebody, that's my choice. Do you understand where this all comes into play? When we start thinking that life is in our hands, and we lose the aspect that there's a God out there, and it's all in our hands. That's when we run into a lot of problems. John. I don't know if people know the story of Terry Joe, but her mother was had cancer, and they did not know that she was pregnant with Terry Joe. And so when they put the cancer in remission, they discovered that there was a baby in her womb. And they said to her, you need to abort this child because yeah. after all the chemotherapy and the radiation, it will probably come out wrong. Right. Okay. They refused. You just said, God opens the room. God controls the room. Yeah. Right there. And here's one other thing I think that churches should do in the state of Texas and other states where they're saying abortions are illegal. Churches should lobby their state legislatures yeah, to get orphanages run by churches yeah. because to adopt a child is way, way, way too expensive. Yeah. And it's in the wrong people's hands to get it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, the story that my sister had about where she respected life, uh, it was her second baby. She named the daughter Lauren. Uh, she uh, was told that the baby was encephalitic. And uh, 
the doctor was encouraging abortion. She just was very, she still to this day is very pro life, but uh, she said, No, I'm looking for another doctor. And even though she recognized that the baby may not survive outside the womb, she, she'll tell you to this day, she was going to put the baby's life in the hands of who? That's what she did. Baby was born. Uh, baby lived one hour, an hour outside the womb. Pastor was there, baptized the baby immediately. And they were able to hold the baby because it died. You know. Um, when the social worker came to see my sister upon her dismissal from the hospital, she was disturbed. Told my sister that I don't understand why you're so happy. You should be grieving. You just lost a child. My sister told the social worker, she says, I'm rejoicing because I've been grieving for five months. Now I know my baby has died. Can you not be joyous with me? All how you look at life, isn't it? All how you look at life. Yeah. And whose is it? And where is it going? And I think when you when you look at it that way, you're going to have a whole different aspect about life in the womb. That uh, it's it's God God is control of it, not us. And from the moment of conception, um, you know, I always wonder about the Constitution, but the Supreme Court right now is kind of let out the fact that it's no longer to deal with it. But I, I basically have said since I've been following this all my life. Is A, you gotta fight on the constitutional grounds of this, or B, fight on whether or not when is a person a person? Because does the constitution protect life? Uh, no, it doesn't. Because if the constitution protects life, we couldn't have hamburgers at McDonald's. <laughs> it protects a person, but person. Nobody argued personally. I've been waiting for some lawyers to get up and say, let's forget about the argument of life. Let's talk about personhood who's guaranteed rights of the Constitution. And, and from, from all the times the Supreme Court has been saying, the one who determines personhood, the, hand, the person who is able to have the right to determine personhood is not God, but who? The mother. The mother's actually in the place of God because if the mother is carrying a child to term and believes that that's a person and the doctor does something that causes a miscarriage, can that mother sue the doctor? Yes, because the mother is determined as a person, has personal constitutional protection. But at the same time, when the mother doesn't think it's a person, goes to a doctor or a child, do you, do you realize the power that society gives to mom? It's divine, it's God power. And uh, we need to kind of do our best we can to say, you know, personhood and everything about that is God. So what I have found interesting is I've been waiting for this argument for years. And today I read on MSN.com, you know what the left is all of a sudden using for terminology? Feel personhood. Why didn't the pro-life go there? And now the left is saying the danger of fetal personhood. They're using the terms that we should have used a long time ago. So fascinating how things get turned and what terms you use. Okay. Well, that's, uh, you know, we're not going to resolve things, but I, I hope I've given you some information. Uh, Kelly, you have anything to add? No? Huh? <laughs> Donna. Who had a daughter who is now 42. She, um, she can't talk. She can't do anything. She was born that way. It's some kind of disease. I can't even, she didn't even know the name of it. But that whenever they had her, so the wife got pregnant and said, oh, no, they went to the doctor to see whether or not if they had another child, we'd come out with the same problem. 
The doctor said that's one in a million chance. Yeah. I had a son or the same way. Mm. He died three years ago. These children were not even supposed to make it out of the child or even yeah. teenagers. Right. So whose responsibility is that the doctors or are you talk about suing someone if something goes wrong? Yeah. If the doctor gives you information that tells you that's a one in a million chance, is that one in a million? Think about the expense and the care and everything these people have had to do with two children in the same. Yeah, it goes back to that situation. You turn it over to God or not, you know. Um, when you're on the on the flip side, when you when you have a person on a hard one life machine, and 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 they have a will of a, a DNR, and it's very well known that the, the DNR is there, a family can sometimes override that and keep them on that hard one machine. Um, we would say that uh, in our church body that, you know, I love the way that this guy explained it. Pull the plug and give God the chance. Pull the plug and give God the chance. If God wants that life to survive, it will survive. If God does not, he wants it to come home. So, you know, St. Magdalene, you, when you look at that, you just buy and give Put it in the hands of God rather than in the hands of us to make that decision. It's just very hard for us, I think. I didn't I would not want to be put on the phone about one in a million and say, okay, well then I'm not gonna to want to do this or that. But, you know, there's just a point in part that we just gotta turn our life over to God. today and again if you have more information you think I should know because I, I love to flood myself with information on this topic in order to make sure I present it truthfully and, and not just because of the emotions and not because of my personal feelings but what is the objective truth what is the absolute truth which dominates our ethical decisions Let's close with prayer. Father, we ask the Lord for you to bring peace and healing to our country as some division has been made because of a decision up in our federal Supreme Court. Help, O oh Lord, our conversations to be civil as we move into the future. Help us not be afraid also to speak up, O oh Lord, for the absolute truth revealed to us in Jesus Christ. Help us to understand what it means, O oh Lord, what Jesus did. He turned his life over to you, even to the point of the cross. Help us turn our lives over to you as our Savior. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.